Welcome to the Rules of Engagement for the Defense Sector. Uh, I'm Srini Mirmira, and I will serve as your moderator for the next 50 minutes. And as majority of you know, the Departments of Energy and the Department of, uh, Departments of Energy and Defense have a memorandum of understanding under which we have embarked on several, energy, several projects related to energy technology. I guess the Department of Defense very much recognizes the fact that uh, advanced energy technologies can be very game-changing in their applications. And from the ARPA-E side, we truly believe that the Department of Defense can be an incredible early market or early adopter for, our techno for the technologies that we are funding and having developed. It's truly a win-win scenario, but the success, of the, success, the success of this effort very much hinges upon the fact that we would like our energy innovators to understand the intricacies, understand, understand the intricacies of the acquisition process of the Department of Defense as well as have access to these opportunities. And this is precisely why we have organized this panel for you this afternoon. And uh, we have three excellent speakers this afternoon, and each one of them has promised that they will cut out the high-level spiels and get very di directly into the nitty-gritty of the kind of how to engage with the Department of Defense, give you some practical advice. So I hope they keep to their promise. And uh, first we have uh, Dr. John Fisher from the um, for the, the director of the uh, Defense Laboratories Enterprise, who will uh, give you a kind of outline the acquisition process of the Department of Defense, as well as why engaging with the defense laboratories could be a very valuable entry point into the sector. Next, we have Mr. Peter Morico, a Raytheon, Eng a Raytheon Engineering Fellow, who will give you the perspective of a defense contractor as well as the value that the defense industrial base brings to the table. Lastly, we have Colonel Charette, the director for the uh, U.S. Marine Corps en Expeditionary Energy Office, who will tell you what the, what the customer really wants and, the, and what the, from a, give you an end-user perspective. We have requested that each one of these speakers restrict their talks to about 10 minutes, so we have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end for questions, questions and answers. So without any further delay, uh, Dr. John Fisher. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the chart that you see in front of you is a product of the Defense Acquisition University, which is a very top-level description of the Department of Defense acquisition process. Starting up at the upper left-hand corner is where basic research begins all the way through the, the right-hand side of the chart, which is support and demilitarization of deployed systems. It's obvious from this chart that it's an extremely complicated process and people who do this for a living spend many years in school, many years of experience and there, to be a seasoned program manager one has to have a high level of demonstrated performance to handle large budgets and also to get products out to the field. As you can see from the past 10 years of, of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, getting supplies, getting equipment to troops, airmen and such is, is extremely important and the military li literally lives and dies on the ability to get equipment out to the field. Also, I'm sure you're aware from press reports over the past several years that the Department of Defense is one of the biggest consumers of energy in the world for very good reason. From the line of work that we're in, energy is extremely important and performance of equipment is usually a first line of re first requirement rather than being energy efficient. One of the big challenges we face is how do we actually get new technology out to the field? How do we get new concepts brought forward? How do we develop new concepts? Here in this city, if you go downtown, <clears throat> or on the edge of town rather, you'll see the Pentagon. Within the Pentagon, there's approximately 20,000 employees, and on any given day, there's somewhere between six and 9,000 visitors in that building. It's a secure facility, so people just can't walk. And you have to know why you're there and where you're going and who you're going to meet with. And from this chart and the fact that that building is one of the biggest office buildings in the world, you can see that it's not a very easy, straightforward process. The particular office that I run is responsible for developing policy which governs the Department of Defense laboratories. Across the country, there are 62 laboratories that spread across 22 different states. And those laboratories do everything from basic research all the way through to systems engineering, logistics support, demilitarization, and quick response to deployed warfighters across all of the services. What I invite you to consider is if you have a new concept, if you have a brand new idea that may not have a requirement, if you have ideas that would address requirements, to consider teaming up with a defense laboratory. 
The reason I make this suggestion is that the laboratory world lives in this chart. People in that defense laboratory enterprise know this chart inside and outside. They have many years' experience all the way from the basic research programs through acquisition program support and quick response to deployed forces. They get the experience from going to Defense Acquisition University. They actually have formal training. And then the other end of the spectrum is just people who've been around a long, long time who understand the process inside and out. When you approach a defense lab or a program manager as such, it's very, very, very important to understand what you're trying to do. Are you trying to sell a new concept? Or are you trying to meet a requirement? You'll hear a, a term bandied about quite a bit, technology push, requirements pull. Requirements pull, of course, is something where if there's a well-established requirement out there, do you have something that addresses that requirement? Now, something to be aware of, if you have something that addresses that requirement, there's a very high probability that a lot of other people have things that address that requirement. To be successful in getting something new into the Department of Defense acquisition process, you need patience and you need perseverance, and you need a lot of each. It is extremely rare for somebody to walk in and sell a project, sell a program on their very first time. You have to understand not only this chart with the process, but you have to understand where do you go to talk to people to get, get your idea heard, to get your idea vetted. Something that happens routinely within the defense process is you're going to find out that you have to go talk to a program executive officer, a program manager, etc. You're going to talk to person A. After he or she listens to what you have to say, they're going to say, great, now you need to go talk to person B. When you go talk to person B, then they're going to say, go talk to person C. After you get done talking to person C, you're going to go on down the line. Don't be surprised if you end up back at person A. Well, the reason you're back at person A is because all those folks talk to one another. They're all comparing notes, and they're all trying to understand what you have and what value it brings. And when it comes to a technology, almost always the program manager, the person that you're trying to sell the idea to will go back to that defense laboratory for their service or their particular program and ask the technical experts within that laboratory, what do you think of that idea? What do you think of that concept? Is it something that we should be pursuing? That's something that happens if you're meeting a well-defined requirement. If you have a new idea that does not have a requirement, but it's something really cool that could save a lot of money or bring a new warfighting capability, that's the, that's the technology push. In something like that, it is even more important to have a strong linkage with a laboratory. Because if you're bringing something forward that's brand new, there's a very high probability that a program manager will not understand the specifics of what you're talking about, the value of what you have, and the value of what you're bringing forward. In that case, again, a program manager or program executive officer will go to a laboratory and ask for some technical expert's opinion what is the value of this new concept? What is the value of the idea? And while it's valuable to bring forward new ideas, new concepts, it is even more valuable if you can tie that concept to a warfighting capability. So if you have a new idea, a new approach, something new that has never been done before, if you can associate that with, if we follow this through and fund it and develop a program, develop a new particular type of technology, what warfighting capability does it bring that it do, we do not have now? And here again, somebody in a defense laboratory who does this kind of thing for a living will be able to understand and explain and help you put together a story that says, if we are more energy efficient, if we have this new lightweight battery pack, if we have a new high density fuel, et cetera, here is the warfighting capability that we bring. And it might be something as simple as it'll be, it will reduce the logistics footprint, it'll save money, it'll enable us to buy more other stuff, or with the budget going down, as we think it's going to happen in the next few years, it'll just make us more cost effective and we'll be able to keep doing the same mission without any negative impact if we, versus if we stay with the current technology, which we just simply can't afford. So. Understand what you have, understand the warfighting capability it brings, understand what this, what this chart can bring. And the, this chart, by the way, if you Google Defense Acquisition University, it'll take you right to this chart and you can see it. And there are many, many pages of backup documentation to this. 
understand that as best you can. Then connect with a defense laboratory to understand the specifics of what you have and then start working the chart. Now, if you have a brand new idea, you're going to start at the left side and work to the right. If you have, a, if you have an idea that's addressing a requirement, it's a variation of something we have right now, but just better, you'll start someplace in the middle and then you'll move to the right. So it's, it's extremely important that we connect with you because what you have is a value the Defense Department needs your ideas, it needs your work, it needs your concepts, and defense laboratories can help you get your ideas into the system and work this chart. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Next we have Peter Mariko from, from Raytheon. Please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, let's go right to slide four, please. I beg your pardon? Uh, all right, I'm going to, uh, Serena has uh, asked us to cut to the chase, so that's where we're going here. Um, so customer requirements are now more stressing than ever. They're stressing for terms of power and energy density, peak power efficiency, modularity, fault tolerance, and graceful degradation. Power systems today must embrace developing technologies in order to meet these stressing system requirements. So we're now seeing multiple technologies promoted in a single power system. We call this hybrid power systems. And a testament to the proliferation of hybrid power systems is demonstrated in the automotive industry, who have adopted the word hybrid to denote mainly gasoline and electric combined propulsion vehicles, which have characteristics of extraordinary efficiency. Safely and efficiently controlling the multiple technologies and following the, f and, and the flow of energy has become much more of a critical task than it has ever been before. Power and energy management is the cornerstone by which advanced power system will succeed. This heralds in C2 software and algorithm development as major task elements in power system design. And as Carmen said earlier in, in her talk, um, it's all about smart and innovative power system design. This is a paradigm shift. Power system designers must consider the energy source, the fuel. This is especially vi vital in high energy dense systems. The military has extreme density requirements. The most important element that we use to frame power systems is to define the power utilized as a function of time. Power versus time is utilized in determining all other aspects of the power system. As shown in a graph that you see here, the energy density of a system approaches the source density within about an order of magnitude. That is, the fuel is always more dense than a system that makes the fuel and converts it into, electric, and converts it into electrons. The source energy includes everything from wood, liquid hydrogen, hydrazine, jet fuel, JP, nuclear, everything. Today's most energy dense power conversion systems are only approaching 10% of the density of the source. It's a major accomplishment to be sure. Advanced power systems density is limited, however, as compared with other technologies, such as the computational density of power of microprocessors, which has not grown in percentage, but many orders of magnitude. We have fundamental limits there, too. Power system density using chemical potential energy, though, is limited to just a small percentage. This is a physical reality. So I put together this chart because I couldn't find it anywhere. And I gathered all of the volumetric energy of these elements, compounds, and systems, and I graphed them in ascending order so that you see here on the graph on the vertical axis, you see watt hours per liter. And on the horizontal axis are just the ascending order of the different elements and systems. And, above, and the legend above the yellow line are elements and compounds, and below the yellow line are systems. And you might say to yourself, well, fuel cells have no energy density. That's true. They have power density. Fuel cells are up here. And, and other systems that utilize fuel, such as engines, to demonstrate that these things, to achieve a very high energy dense system, must act in concert with a quantity of fuel to fit in a certain volume. I chose volumetric energy density um, in terms of watt hours per liter instead of gravimetric energy density because the first thing a power system must do is to be able to fit in a box. So if it doesn't fit, it doesn't matter how light it is. Not to mention that gravimetric density isn't very important, it is. Um, so some interesting observations here, diesel and jet fuel and gasoline. 
of roughly four times the energy density of liquid hydrogen, and it's the hydrogen in, the, in those fuels that actually deliver the energy. Chemical energy, as we know it, is, is available here to deliver energy up in the order of about three times 10 to the power of four watt hours per liter. Nuclear energy, fission of U-235 is up around five times 10 to the power of 12. That's 100 million times more energy dense. It's not so easy to use, though. Plus, the harsh reality is that we do not have a choice between nuclear and chemical. We're not asking for much, an uh, order of magnitude more than the three times 10 to the fourth would be a wonderful achievement and allow us to construct extremely advanced power systems. But there's nothing in the physical reality that's gonna let us get there. So we've gotta work with what we've got today. So perhaps someday the theoretical physicists will determine what the nature of energy and matter are and lead us down a, a better path. Acquisition is a, uh, is a problem we face in proposing energy efficient solutions. There's policies, objectives, strategies. End users are not incentivized to save fuel directly because they have no requirement and they can't be expected to do so. In some sense, it's not human nature. It's, it's, it is human nature not to worry about fuel utilization if you don't have to pay for it. Plus, you have a job to do. Imagine reducing sorties, having rolling blackouts at FOBs, eliminating patrols, turning off radars, and the like. It's, it's not going to happen. The fuel source savings must come from the design itself. And the only way that can happen is to have an energy and efficiency as requirements that must be answered and graded as part of defense solicitations. These key performance parameters are the cornerstone of making this happen. The government supplies energy for all its systems and achieves significant cost savings by virtue of the immense quantity of energy it buys on an annual basis. Contractor innovations are stifled by the accountability for those ener energy resources not always being passed down to the contractor. The old school thinking of it takes what it takes has been replaced by requirements that realize smaller, lighter, efficient, and less expensive systems. However, much can be done with the existing legacy systems, small to large. It is compulsory that the contractor focus and completely understand the customer needs in order to develop improvements which will realize significant return on investment to legacy systems. John talked about this yet, and Ryan had talked about this. Cheryl Martin this morning talked about this. So important, contact, get involved with your customer. ROI in the DOD space is just as important in the commercial industrial sector, if not more so. Contractors, as we are, we use all manner of funding we can to help advance these systems, internal research and development outside. So our offering significant improvements to customers relies on discovering and promoting these new technologies that are best suited for use in DOD equipment and systems. Since no one company or organization or laboratory can supply the myriad of technologies required, it's imperative to develop strong partner relationships with outside companies, universities, and national labs. You, you partner with companies and, and labs that offer the most discriminating technologies in their fields of expertise to meet your program goals. And we're looking for people like you, creators of the technology products. And we visited many of you and will continue to do so. In developing technology-oriented business cases, cooperative agreements are preceded by data gathering, meetings to discuss alignment, market focus, site visits, and tech demonstrators. The due diligence is vital. It's as vital as the customer focus is. Important as it is to ensure this alignment with partner companies, it is equally important to recognize their limitations. It's especially true of smaller companies. If if we divert small companies outside of their swim lanes, then we risk burdening them with too much financial risk, and this is detrimental to their businesses. So, and lastly, keeping your technologists focused on discriminating insertions is another aspect of this continual development. It's hurting of the cats, of course. Uh, lastly, power and energy are often enablers and not the main mission of the end user. So. One of, the, one of the questions I get asked is, how do we find technologists and companies? And, and we heard a little bit, a lot about that today, and it's, it's difficult just to, to go find people in a company. It takes persistence. It takes a lot of patience. As important as the engines in an F-18 are, 
They, do, they are not the main function of the aircraft. They enable the aircraft to do the missions to which it was designed and envisioned to perform. The same paradigm exists for radar systems, sensors, vehicles, radios, missiles, all kinds of systems. In companies that are responsible for such systems as these, designers who are responsible for power are going to be difficult to find. They're aligned in an organization which is matrix reporting and not aligned with any one program. To bring about a change in advance in a power system, a company must commit funding resources in technology areas that itself does not generate revenue. This is a very hard sell. Finding power and energy champions requires patience, a broad and deep technology background, excellent business acumen, and good investigative skills. Once contact is established, get as many referrals as possible and establish links to the stakeholders in your company. And as the relationship matures, introduce your partners to, customer, to your customers to better communicate and develop additional value propositions. And lastly, by bringing multiple partners together, you'll develop products and pursuits that you could not have otherwise seen without forming that partnership in the first place. And these, in this case, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Thank you. How do you, Colonel? Bring this home. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Let me see if the slides come up. Um, how many folks do we have here from academia? All right. How about industry? Small industry. All right. A big industry. Okay. All right. So your nightmare will begin in a different part of the process. We found out, uh, we did a study in 2010 and found out we were losing one Marine for every 50 in fuel water con truck convoys on the battlefield. So we set up a new office. And uh, I happen to have the privilege of being the first director of that office. It's called the Expeditionary Energy Office, where our focus is to maintain the lethality we've gained today in the last 10 years of continuous combat, but to reduce the risk to our force. So what everybody talked about here today is what we're trying to promote is setting the conditions for the right requirements as we move forward. We just put out a, uh, a strategy a year ago. It's called the Expeditionary Energy Strategy for the Marine Corps. It's a basis to battlefield strategy. Basically tells everybody in academia, industry, big and small, where we're headed where we think we're headed, and that's to make a Marine Corps that in 2025 can go ashore with all the kind of stuff we have on the battlefield today, but only bring the mobility fuels we need when we get there. We're not going to give up liquid fuel by 2025. I don't know what the source of that fuel is going to be. I'll let the debate rage over that. But we are going to continue to use liquid petroleum in some way, or liquid fuel in some way. And so what we want to do, though, is our command and control systems, they're more efficient. Our living conditions are more efficient. The generators we use, we hope not to have them. We'll actually be living off our vehicles. We'll be using renewables. We'll be using storage systems uh, today and tomorrow. It was interesting. I saw the one slide up there, um, that Raytheon slide. Be careful with those guys. When they see you're looking at somebody, they buy them. It's probably good for your smaller companies. But I'll give you a little sea story behind that slide. Um, we set up a couple years ago, along with this office, the expeditionary uh, forward, the experimental forward operating base, where we invite industry to come in, and it's not just to do the comf comfort control, very energy efficient room we have here today, um, but it is to bring industry out in our environment and to show us what they got. And it's a uh, the experimental forward operating base is going to go right now. The next one goes down in Camp Lejeune where we're looking at individual power systems and individual water systems. Thus far, we've run four different experimental forward operating bases where we've learned from industry, Raytheon one of them, and others. Uh, we've looked at probably, in the field we've actually looked at at this time, about 50 different technologies where we've actually metered up those technologies. And it's been fascinating to learn in the field from industry real time. So what it does is it helps us craft those requirements as we go forward and we prevent this nightmare. So wherever you are, whether you're academia, whether you're industry, or wherever you're at in this crowd, 
you, in, you enter this thing at a different point. And the top line, it's hard to see, obviously, but that's the need. This is, that's the need line. That's where the guys like us in uniform define the requirement. That center nightmare for you is the DOD acquisition system. That's an event-driven process. The bottom line is our budget-driven process. That's every year. That's when we all get into the food fight, into the pen, <laughs> figuring out who's got the best and who's the strongest, and we work out the budgeting process. So you have three very disparate processes all working, and for you all to get involved in them, it all depends on what you're offering and where at. And that was already covered quite well by John. What I'll tell you, though, is this process shouldn't be scary to you. Um, anybody hear uh, Steve Blank's presentation today? Awesome. How did he end that presentation? Remember Durant ended up dead, broke. And Salone knew this. All right? Salone knew this. He was the accountant, but he also knew this. So if you're really interested in navigating the DOD process, you should learn this and then find out there's different people to intersect depending on who you are and where you want to intersect, and that is key. But you want to be a Sloan in the process, learn this process. And I like to say, people give me crap about this all the time. They go, well, wh why is it so complex? It's not really that complex. It's built by man. This didn't just come down. I, I like to call it the three Bs. It got produced because of blood, buffoonery, and bias. Blood because when we were building things, we killed them along the way, so we had to build another block. Buffoonery, well, some people did something not that they should have done, like enrich themselves, and so we had to build another block. And then bias, where we have people that just didn't want to get the word, that, you know, the buggy whip or the carriage has gone away, and they kept buying something they should not have bought. So this is what this process is all about. So if you want to make that uh, big institution up at MIT, this is something you ought to learn if you're that interested in sticking around DOD and figure out where to go. We cover the top line in the military. That's the need process. So what we've done over the last couple of years to accelerate, and I think we missed one of my first slides here, was a, a, a maxim by Einstein. Basically, you can't continue to do things the same way and expect a different result, you know, kind of the definition of insanity. This is a patrol base in Afghanistan that we rapidly deployed technologies via the XFOB process um, to get them to the field quickly. This is a, a, the top part of a, a bunker where you actually, the Marines had to be in full combat gear to put these panels up because they would get shot at at the berm. But once we got those panels in place, we were able to reduce fuel consumption and that COC by over 55% and maintenance time on generators 80%. It's a hybrid power system. It's something we're very interested in right now. We're spending a lot of time in looking around solar, flexible uh, solar systems that are high efficiency, storage systems, and smart controls for point source kind of generation of power. Right now we're looking at 45 kilowatts and below. Because these Marines on the battlefield today, to get them off the road, they need more efficient systems. So we remember those, we don't relearn the lessons of today tomorrow and we prevent that one in 50 in the future. So that's what it's all about for us, making a lighter, more combat effective Marine Corps, uh, we're not interested in global warming and other initiatives. We're focused on one thing, giving the American taxpayer a combat effective Marine Corps so in the future it can go do its mission and do it effectively with less energy required. Thank you. I believe we should have mics, right? I guess we have one mic up there. So I'll open it up to the audience for questions for the three gentlemen. Any takers? I guess we're done. <coughs> okay, we can try. Or I'll be happy to give you my mic if that doesn't work. We'll get, it, we'll get it done. My, my question is this. An old Chinese proverb says that the 
journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. What is the first step in introducing? Who is the contact person for introducing an amazing disruptive green technology that can not only save soldiers' lives, but also reduce uh, the energy consumption needed for the military to perform on day-to-day -day operations in the battlefield? Me? Okay, afterwards Send me I'll be your card. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we get them all the time. Be happy to talk to you, sir. And then we'll try to... What I try to do is, this office is pretty new, so we're, we've got a lot of latitude by the Commandant of the Marine Corps. We have uh, the ability to talk to anybody we'd like, since we're not involved in the actual... The neat thing about having this office is, even though we don't... We know about those processes, we're not in, actively involved in any of those processes, so we're not held any legal ramifications uh, in the FARs or anything like that. So one of the things the lawyers told me when we started off is, as long as you talk to everybody, maybe there's more out there, then you can't exclude anyone. So would be happy to talk to you, sir. And what I like to do is when I sit down with folks is try to give them where we think they ought to go next in the institution. We try to help them whether, you know, whether we can help, probably or may or may not, depends on what technology is and where we're at. But it gives us an opportunity to sit down one-on-one -on -one with industry or academia, tell them where we're at more specifically than we kind of gave you a real quick view today, and then we'll try to do is figure out where to enter the institution. There's, depending on the type of technology or the type of idea, there's so many different places to enter at the technology. You can go to the labs, you can go down into acquisitions, you can go, hey, listen, we're not quite there yet, you need to mature it, or there's SIBRs, or there's a whole host of ways to enter. Uh, we have a lot of companies that just watch the, uh, the Fed biz ops to see what's coming up. So there's a lot of different ways. So what I'd like to do is somebody's eager and wants to come in, give me your card. Uh, we'll set up something and we'll try to do something either over the phone, uh, listen to more about what your technology is, and give you an idea where, you ought to, where we ought to think we're, from a Marine Corps perspective, you enter the process. Does that help you out? Other questions? I think uh, John just informed me that all mics are live, so... Um. Oh. Thank you very much. I'm Mike Hart with Sierra Energy. We have a waste energy gasification technology. Colonel Shrek, good seeing you again, sir. Um, my question is that we've been looking at the ESTCP. I'm sure I got the acronym right, sort of. Um, but the solicitation they have going out. The question is, is we've talked to folks in each of the different services that have an interest in using our technology. Everybody seems to be looking for fieldable, relatively large scale. In our case, 25 tons a day to make 1,000 gallons a day of clean diesel and a similar amount of clean water. The problem is the amount of money that's available in that only makes a very small system. Right. So it's not at the same scale. Right. Is it something that we're better off trying to work uh, make a very small pilot with these folks, or is it better to work with an individual service that's actually looking to field a system? Right. Any one of you. Yeah. The, uh, right, right now, based on you know, our expeditionary nature, we talked before about this. We're not looking right now at, at waste energy at this point or waste solutions. Uh, right now, the Army is doing some good work up at Aberdeen looking at uh, solutions. I think we talked before about getting in contact with those folks, but if you haven't yet, give me your card and I can try to get you in contact with the Army folks that are looking at uh, waste energy Thank or you. waste solutions. I mean, that's all I can say about that right uh, now. John, Peter, any comments on that? If you were to give me your card and contact information, what I can do and some information on the details of what your particular technology or system you have, I can hook you up with some people out in, in the lab world and you can start having that dialogue and based on the service requirement, based on the service funding availability and such, you can make that determination, one system, big system, small and such. So <clears throat> unfortunately, no one size fits all because these services have such varying requirements. It is many times a service unique application and requirement. But to bring up the point, John, on that is right now there is no military requirement in the operational world for a system. A lot of the work that's going on right now is done in some developmental work and that kind of stuff to see if this technology, uh, for example, I think we mentioned this in the past, the Army had deployed one to Afghanistan, a, a paralysis-based machine to Afghanistan. It had a lot of problems in the desert. So there's still, you know, it's not that we're not interested, it's there's still some concerns of maturity of technologies for operational use, and that's why the labs 
are probably a good place. But there isn't a, that I'm aware of any service having a hard military requirement, except possibly the Navy has some requirements at sea for, for waste on the ships. That I'm only, that's the only requirement I'm aware of, that they have to have some way of handling their waste on shipping. Other questions? Please. Uh, if you could please elaborate on that last point, it seems to me what the gentleman raised speaks to a larger question of the resources throughout DOD for demonstration validation and scaling up these systems in particular. And I, I see bits and pieces of these in different parts of the services and different parts of uh, headquarters. Um, I, I still don't have a great sense of where the resources are, how accessible they are, and uh, for scaling up these types of systems, uh, where the different entry points are. If there's something that would have applicability across all of the services at OSD, Office Secretary of Defense, there are a number of programs, such as Quick Reaction Fund, which is something that can get out there in less than 12 months. There's a joint concept technology demonstration program. There are a number of programs, funded programs, that look across something that have a lot of service applicability, joint applicability. If there's something that would be unique to a service, then I would direct you down into a service. And it depends. If it's a basic research project, then I would put you in touch with people at a, for example, Office of Naval Research and such. If it's something more mature and ready for prototyping, then, again, I would put, connect you with a laboratory because there is probably something already going on related and the laboratory can help you refine it to something that would have a more meaningful demonstration and get something out the field quicker. So joint, there's OSD. If it's individual service, then we put you down to the individual service depending on project maturity. But John, let me, let me ask you, so at what stage does, like, for example, like SOCOM get interested? At what TRL level does SOCOM get interested in a technology? SOCOM, Special Operations Command, is, is interested in things that are usually TRL 6 or 7, something very mature, something that has been ready for demonstration, prototyping, and with very little effort could be made into several units and deployed. So it's something much more mature than the, a service that might be interested in a basic science project. And the labs, of course, would be... Um, laboratories can cover that whole spectrum, so there are much a lot... much earlier stage as well. There are many laboratories, again, depending on application, which work very closely with SOCOM to get something assessed, matured, and out to the field. Thank you. Please, go ahead, sir. Thank you. My name is Todd Apple. I'm with the DuPont Company. I had a question for you. I'd be interested in, in your feedback with respect to uh, material supply, uh, suppliers that are not prime contractors. And for instance, um, in the solar arrays, we make materials. How, how excited or, or uh, interested would uh, the department be in discussing with suppliers that are several steps back from the final assembly makers with regard to the criticality of materials that go in to impacting the final performance of the, the widget, even though we're not a, a Lockheed or a Raytheon that supplies that. And so I'd appreciate any of your thoughts on that. Go ahead. No, it's a great question. We get it a lot because there's only so many Lockheeds and Raytheons in the world. Um, and what we try to do is obviously there's a couple paths forward there. Um, the one thing we're doing today that's different than in the past is through the experimental forward operating base process, this gives us a hands to really understand technology. And so a lot of times we get smaller companies at XFOB that may or may not, like the one system you saw on the Raytheon slide was a system we had tested at XFOB. Um, Raytheon then purchased that company later on, uh, and they did quite well. But we learned a lot from that. But what my point is, is when we do that, we learn about how to write a better requirement. And so when we get technologies, we can't at the end of the day in the contracting process tell anybody to buy, you know, if we work with an integrator, we want a hybrid system per se. Let's say that's something we're pursuing right now is hybrid, hybrid systems. We, we know that some company X has the best solar panel on the market. But the company that wins the contract to build the hybrid system isn't that company. So what we try to do is, as we've learned going through the process, when we understand the technologies better, we write a tighter requirement. So when we say we want a solar panel that has this efficiency with this flexibility, with this durability, 
size weight. We're not trying to say we want DuPont's thing, but because other people could compete for it, but this is the level of the bar because we've learned better. In the process, in the past, what we would do is say, build me a hybrid power system, whomever. And they would figure out what to put into it. And what we found sometimes, perfect example, is we deployed flexible solar battery chargers. They're only about 60 watt panels. But we deployed them recently to Afghanistan. We've gotten over 2,000 of them. It was 1990s technology. Because we didn't know the technology could take us to another level. Now we just got done closing the solicitation for phase two. We're a heck of a lot smarter now because of the XFOB process, the experimental forward operating process. So now when we write our next requirement as we're going through now, we can raise the bar on the, for this case, the solar system that, and the power electronics because we deployed 1990s technology in 2010. We kind of want to at least catch up a little bit. But that's the kind of thing, what you really have to do at the end of the day is get in these avenues and so we as a military get better at writing the requirement so then when the integrator, whoever gets that process, you know, knows that, hey, this is probably the guy that has the best thing. We can't say that, it's illegal to do that, but at least we've raised the bar on the technology that's built into the requirement. Does that make sense, sir? It's, it's, it's a tough thing. We see a lot of companies just in that same position. They want it, they have a product, but we've already got an integrator. So it happens on vehicles a lot too. Big thing on vehicles. So just before I go back to the floor, Peter, let me just ask you a quick question. At what, thank you, Colonel. At what, what stage does like Raytheon or so other defense, like the Raytheons and Lockheeds, the Boeings, get kind of interested in kind of some of the neat, innovative work that like our performers would be prefer, uh, conducting? Yeah, so what was, when, when do you get excited, etc.? For, for power and energy, because we don't have a uh, power and energy company per se. We're interested mainly at the TRL three to five level, and we're doing exactly that. We're, we're bringing technologies in that can advance these systems so that they provide a meaningful discriminating feature for our customers, right, for, for Colonel Shred here. And, and uh, that's, that's the name of the game, to really bring that low-level discriminating technology in, because if it was out there already, we'd have been all over it, you know. And it, if it's out there right now and mature, it is 90s technology. So that's, that's where we need to go, and that's what we do. We uncover that, discover it, do our due diligence, bring it in, and see what we can do with it. And so do you have active scouting for that? What do you, how do you guys do it? So uh, I'm actually running the uh, what Raytheon calls the Power Cell Enterprise Campaign. It's a multi-year uh, task which... Uh, involves the discovery, promotion, and insertion of technologies for those purposes, That's for right. exactly that purpose. So even though power isn't an end product of the company, it's recognized as being extremely important. And so the company's put all of its, uh, well, not all of it, but a, a portion, a significant portion of its IRAD uh, towards this effort. Excellent. Please. Hi. Uh, I'm Anthony Waits, and I'm a consultant. I work with a number of startup companies. Um, one, of my, one of my clients is called QuantumWise, and it's a, um, we're currently um, uh, supplying uh, the defense labs. So we're not a system that would be deployed um, in, in the field, but we're something that would be sold to, uh, to researchers. And um, what we've, I find is that it's, it's quite difficult to uh, engage with the um, um, defense labs in a sense that there's a, there's a critical mass kind of problem. We have quite a few scientists that would like to, to use our, our software, but, but only a few of them seem to have budget authorities. So are, but yet the defense labs, I know there's this thing called the MOD office, and they can buy large quantities uh, of software that go across all the, all the different centers, um, but you have to have you know, a certain number of users. So there's kind of this chicken and egg, egg problem. So like we, we focus you know, very heavily. Um, we have, so we have you know, a user in Air Force, a user in Navy. There's other folks in, uh, at NRL that could potentially use it, and a bunch at, at Army, but we just can't get any traction in Army. So we're kind of almost giving up on that and just focusing on making our, you know, our current users in, uh, in Air Force and, uh, and, and NRL happy. But any, any, any suggestions yeah, John, about kind of any, how to bridge this? I wish I had an elegant answer for your question. Unfortunately, I do not. The, because there are so many people trying to sell different products to a wide variety of, of labs, program offices, and such, it is an extremely competitive environment. So anybody that comes forward, it's, ex, it's very important 
to make sure that the person you're talking to, the group you're talking to, understand what value do you bring, what makes your product stand out amongst others, what extra benefit do we have from investing and such. So it's, as I said during my talk, patience and perseverance. It has to go back over and over and over. Um, do not be surprised if it takes between one and two years to get the attention of somebody to, to give them something new that they would want to invest in. Again, it is, especially now as the budget starts to tighten up, everybody watches where every dollar goes, and there are a lot of people trying to sell stuff. So I would invite just patience and perseverance. And if you give me your, your contact information after this, I can also put you in touch with the headquarters offices and the various services that would look across the labs within a service that, that may actually expand your world a little bit and uh, be of some value. Great. Thank you. More questions? Please go ahead, sir. Uh, Tom Marrero. I'm a professor and an, and an advisor to a small business. Uh, a couple of years ago, we de uh, the company demonstrated an uh, alternative fuel at the Quantico show. Uh, it got up as far as uh, some general in, uh, in Quantico, and uh, the word that I received from was that uh, the general said that you have a very disruptive uh, fuel system, and uh, we're only interested in JP8. Uh, could you uh, explain that? It seems to be contradictory. If they're only interested, the, the DOD and JPA, then why go into all this energy stuff? Well, and furthermore, yeah. uh, if, if the system has the potential to save that soldier's life, I think that it should be uh, considered because it, all you need is basically two, two barrels size of, for your fuel source and a uh, generator that uh, has been uh, maybe six patents on it. Okay, let's just go ahead. Richard. Sure. Yeah, for, really what quick. is the, this thing you're saying run on? What is it? it can't run on JP8? Is that what I understand? It has a no, different... it's a different fuel. Absolutely. It's a different fuel. Okay, got it. It's a fuel. Um, well, there is a DOD instruction that says the single battlefield fuel will be jet propellant 8. That's, there's a, uh, yeah, right. So and there's also the requirement, uh, the no kidding requirement for fuel in DOD is it has to be a fossil based fuel. And it defines that. Okay, so that, there's a lot of that. There's, there's a lot of things that says that's the fuel. There's also another, the, the issue right now is a lot of our equipment is specifically the long pole in the tent is our aircraft. Those engines ha have to have, right now, the way they're designed, JP-8, or a certified alternative. And so that's why the battlefield fuel is driven by the aircraft. And so that's why you have that single battlefield fuel. Otherwise, you would have more different supply lines that you'd be dependent on during war. And so we've gotten to the point where we try to minimize that. Now, I know that there's a lot of aggressive work going on, especially in the Department of Navy, uh, Secretary Mavis has been leading this effort himself personally to look at Verizon's sources of fuel. So there is a lot of opportunities right now for com companies that have a different type of fuel to have a chance to compete in that in space. I mean, the Secretary of Navy is really leading the charge of that. And if you want to get more information on that, I don't have any, I have all the points of contact for that. I'm not, our, the Marine Corps is not, you know, actively going down there since Secretary of the Navy and the, and the Navy are really leading that charge, along with the Air Force. But give me your card at the end, I get you right, in touch with the people. And I'll be delighted okay. to help as well. I yeah, work a lot with the Department of Defense, and particularly the Navy and the, uh, and the Office of Naval Research as well. Thank I'll be you. happy to help. Kerry, I'm going to end with you. Sure. Um, you spoke a little bit about, um, Colonel Charette, um, about some of the requirements, the specifications that, that you yeah. might look at, uh, so, you know, capacity, efficiency, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about for example, you know, uh, solar PV. A lot of the end use, the, the end costs are a lot of it's in installation and maintenance. Um, so, have you thought about is it is it a, a requirement at all for ease of installation? Uh, so, if you can throw up and wire uh, PV panels quicker, is, is that something that that would be a, a requirement of the Marines, or is that sort of a, a second tier? No. It, it, right now, I mean, we want to harvest energy from other sources. We're kind of fascinated with solar because that technology is down the road the furthest. 
We are looking at kinetic and thermal technologies, but they're not as mature to really pursue. To your point on solar, we just got done running an experiment down in uh, Fort Pickett, Virginia, two weeks ago, where we supplied Marines with 13 uh, uh, basically renewable packs with flexible next generation solar on it. We've actually paid to have this stuff made in a laboratory because we're very interested in flexible, high efficiency solar. Uh, we're putting together right now, like, like I said, the update of that solar blanket I talked about earlier in the 1990s. So we are very interested in that right now. And we just got done on our own dime, really literally, uh, had a company make high efficiency, flexible solar to test. And uh, we're waiting back for the results. So we just got done with that experiment two weeks ago. Because what we want is that ability, a flexible panel to just roll out, harvest, or put a patch on a marine as he's on the move to harvest for just the s small systems he has on himself. Does that answer your question, sir? Uh, yeah, it does. Thanks. Sure. I'm sorry, gentlemen. I'm not going to be able to get to you. My sincere apologies. Maybe you can ca catch these gentlemen offline. But the, you know, it's past 5 o'clock. The technology showcase is open. A round of applause to the three panelists. Thank you very much.